Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Paideia Institute online lecture series. Um, thank you all for coming. It's my great pleasure today to introduce um, Ruby Blondell, um, who will be giving a lecture on the topic of Helen of Troy in Hollywood. Uh, Ruby Blondell is a professor of classics and adjunct professor in gender, women, and sexuality studies emeritex at the University of Washington in Seattle. They have published widely on Greek literature and philosophy and on the reception of myth and popular culture. Their books include Helping Friends and Harming Enemies, a study in Sophocles and Greek ethics, Cambridge, 1989. The Play of the Character in Plato's Dialogues, Cambridge University Press, 2002, Helen of Troy, Beauty, Myth, Devastation, Oxford, 2013, and Helen of Troy in Hollywood, out on Princeton University Press, um, just this year, past year. Um, thank you again for coming. Um, go ahead. Thank you very much. First of all, I just want to thank everybody at Paideia for inviting me to talk about my new book. And I will now go into sh screen sharing. Wait. Ugh. Is that working? Does that look right? Yeah, it looks good. Okay. So it's been um, nearly 20 years now since I first got interested in Helen of Troy on screen after I saw the movie Troy. In my view, the film failed to do justice to this ancient heroine. In Greek myth, Helen is the only daughter of Zeus, the king of the gods, with a mortal mother. Like Pandora, the first woman, who is described by Hesiod as a beautiful evil that brought misfortune into an idyllic male world, Helen was literally created to make trouble. Zeus conceived her specifically to reduce the human population by causing the greatest war of all time, the Trojan War. He did so notoriously in the form of a swan, which is why we see her here hatching from an egg. Thanks to her paternity, Helen's beauty is superhuman, and sometimes she's even treated as a goddess. You'll notice that in the slide, her birth takes place on an altar. In contrast to this mythical world, the director of Troy, Wolfgang Peterson, wanted to show the Trojan War realistically. He explained that he wanted to tell the story as it could have happened in reality before it was relegated by the centuries to a more mythical realm. This meant stripping away superhuman aspects of that story as mythological accretions. Most notably and controversially, he excluded the Homeric gods. But this demythologizing approach is also fatal to Helen's archetypal identity. Troy makes no reference to her supernatural origins and avoids presenting her as a figure of awe-inspiring beauty. As for her character, its keynotes are sadness and passivity. Diane Kruger, who played the role, explained that she tried to make Helen human and real and vulnerable in keeping with both script and direction. I wasn't the only one to find the result disappointing. Kruger's performance was widely panned by viewers and critics alike, in large part because she came across as ordinary rather than exceptional. In one reviewer's acid words, she looks less like one of history's great beauties than the third cheerleader from the left at a basketball game. There was more. My favorite, one of my favorites is the face that served a thousand lunches. <laughs> but this disappointing rendition prompted me to think more about Helen as a mythological figure and how to represent her on screen. I started by looking into the various Greek versions of her story. This led to a book on the figure of Helen in Greek myth. This volume published by Oxford in 2013 surveys Helen's story generally, along with ancient Greek attitudes towards female beauty, and then analyzes in detail her appearances in Homer, lyric poetry, the tragedians, and several prose authors. Soon afterwards, I was invited to present the Martin Classical Lectures at Oberlin College, and here I want to shout out to my friend Kirk Ormond in the audience, who was the person who so kindly invited me to do that. Uh, and I offered them a series of lectures on the subject of Helen in popular film and television, which gave rise to the present volume. The book falls into three parts. Part one concerns early Hollywood and the silent period. 
Part two addresses epic film, and part three is concerned with television. The book begins with an introductory chapter addressing some basic issues surrounding beauty, classical antiquity, and popular culture. Early Hollywood was fascinated by ancient Greece, especially ancient Greek beauty, which was supposedly reborn in the persons of the stars. This 1928 article in Photoplay, the leading fan magazine, compares the measurements of male and female movie stars to Apollo and Aphrodite, respectively, in the form of two famous statues, the Apollo Belvedere and the Venus de Milo. This procedure leads the author to the startling discovery that measure for measure, movie gods and goddesses are as beautiful as the ancient ones of Greece. Um, my neighbor's having their roof repaired. I hope it's not being too distracting, the noise. Is it a problem? Okay. In this illustration, um, the contention that, that movie stars are equivalent to ancient Greek divinities is demonstrated by Gro Joan Crawford on the right, who is posing as the Venus de Milo. This supposedly startling discovery is used to support the author's claim that Hollywood is the world's new Olympus and is bringing back the glory that was Greece. At the same time, Hollywood publicity laid great emphasis on the unprecedented realism of film. The camera was thought of as a superior version of the eye, which captured reality in a more truthful and objective way than previous visual media. But this emphasis creates problems for representing Helen on screen. If beauty is in the eye of the beholder, as the modern cliche has it, how can one possibly provide a realistic picture of divine beauty? Casting is a particularly thorny problem. If beauty really is in the eye of the beholder, how can a single actor be chosen to play the part of the most beautiful woman in the world? Many directors have approached the problem by using an unknown actor, as Diane Kruger was at the time, to avoid imposing on Helen the familiar features of a star. But as Kruger's case shows, this is not in itself a recipe for success. In my first chapter, I argue against this practice that Helen should be played by a big star. Her superpower is after all her beauty, which is the most important defining feature of female stardom. Helen's mythic identity would seem to situate her at the apex of the star system, among those preeminent female stars who were referred to as love goddesses. Here's Rita Hayworth, presented in Greek costume as a love goddess of the 1940s. These stars are the sex symbols of collective fantasy with a burden of erotic signification that far outstrips their identity as individuals. Moreover, their glamour, in the words of Virginia Wexman, carries with it the right to romantic domination so that they are free to assert their own sexual desire independent of patriarchal control, just as Helen did when she eloped with Paris. Star casting also helps to finesse the tension between Helen as a divinity and Helen as a mortal. The star may be a movie goddess, but she's also a real contemporary human whose life extends beyond her screen presence. Her biography and personality are assimilated to the roles she plays, making each performance seem like a true expression of this particular actor as a person. Publicity surrounding stars' lives reinforces the re supposedly realism of what is seen on screen by assuring us that real people lie behind the cinematic image. Star casting thus connects us with the real person of the star, even while presenting her as a mythic figure, unattainable by those who gaze on her beauty from afar. But casting is only the first step in representing a beautiful woman on screen. Beauty is constructed not merely by an actor's physical features, but by makeup, hairstyles, and costume. Clothing and accessories have always been integral to the construction of femininity. This is already implicit in the Greek myth of Pandora, who's literally constructed by the gods out of rich clothing and jewelry. Hollywood stars are likewise presented to us in dazzling, eroticized costumes, both on and off the set. Such garments, adornment, and accessories help to construct a woman as a desirable object for the male gaze. At the same time, a love for such decoration encodes a woman's own desire, since it facilitates the pursuit of her own erotic agenda. In the beauty culture of early Hollywood, as in antiquity, this was a source of considerable anxiety, an anxiety focused on the cinematic image of the vamp. Not surprisingly, Helen is characterized in this period as one of the vivid vamps of history, or even as the world's greatest vamp. 
The book's opening chapter discusses this and other issues laying the groundwork for what follows. Subsequent chapters offer a series of case studies examining the portrayal of Helen in specific films and TV episodes. Each of these Helens in her own way embodies concerns about female beauty and agency that distinguish the period in which they were made, inflected in each case by the genre of filmmakers and star. For each work, I ask, how does it address the problem of representing extraordinary beauty as an inheritance from Greek antiquity? Who is cast as Helen and how do they look, dress and act? How is our response to them mediated by such factors as genre, narrative, cinematography, and mise-en-scene? How does each Helen reflect and refract conceptions of beauty and anxieties about its impact within the film's particular historical and cultural context? How does each work use her to examine women's erotic agency? How does it position itself in face of the alien yet familiar culture that it proposed to represent, cueing dialogue between ancient and modern? How does it harness the cultural authority of ancient Greece and specifically of Greek beauty to flatter, lure, or challenge its intended audiences? And finally, how did audiences respond? In chapter two, I look more closely at a film that makes effective use of star casting to represent Helen as a figure of awe-inspiring beauty and erotic self-assertion. The Private Life of Helen of Troy was a silent comedy directed by Alexander Corder in 1927. The title role was played by Maria Corder, Corder's wife and fellow Hungarian, with whom he had recently arrived in Hollywood. Corder was a romantic, ambitious woman who in collaboration with her husband as director had become a top movie star in, in Europe. <laughs> According to the Los Angeles Times, she was cast in the title role of Private Life because, quote, like some of the reports of the fabled Helen, she was a stunning blonde, impressive of bearing and possessed of a lovely figure. Corda's star persona also made her a good fit for the role since she had regularly played the beautiful, sometimes disreputable romantic lead who caused conflict among men. Advanced publicity highlights Corda's European origins over and over again, calling her, for example, as in this slide, an exotic European screen beauty. Drawing on romantic ideas about Greek aesthetics, Photoplay dubbed her Europe's idea of the eternal feminine, exemplifying the calm, modeled perfection of the classic beauty. Along with the prestige of old world culture, this provenance brought an element of risque old world sophistication, preparing us to perceive Cordes Helen in the persona of the world's greatest fan. A Photoplay article describing Cordes' behavior on set presents her as quite literally born to play the part of Helen. In costume for the role, we are told she looks regal, dashing, beautiful, and dangerously piquant. The author reports that in defiance of the Hayes office, Corda exhibits a shocking refusal to clothe her bare legs with tights. She's not only extraordinarily beautiful and enticing, but willful, wild, spoiled, narcissistic, temperamental, and autocratic. All traits, it's implied, befitting the Greek Helen herself. Corda's star persona was thus crafted to make her seem like a natural choice for the role of Helen. Conversely, Helen herself is presented in the film as a modern movie star. The film's very title, The Private Life of Helen of Troy, evokes the public's gossipy fascination with the star's private lives. Within the film itself, Helen's own star appeal is highlighted in ways that invite us to identify her mythic divinity with that of a movie goddess. Like Joan Crawford and many other stars, she's presented as an ancient statue brought to life. Sometimes she appears at the center of a pedimental arrangement where one would expect to see a sculpture of a Greek god or goddess. In other stills, she holds her hand to her breast in a gesture resembling the Venus Pudica pose, familiar from statuary, thus hinting that she's a goddess in human form. Maria Cordes Helen is also endowed with a star's dazzle, exhibitionism, and spectacular wardrobe. Many of her poses evoke those used in glamour shots of movie stars, including Corda herself, to display extravagant evening wear. Many such publicity photos were related to particular films, but others were fashion shots, reflecting the interpenetration of the movie and garment industries. Film stars were used to market the latest fashions and fashions were used in turn to market films to women. 
Advertising for private life promises not only hundreds of beautiful women, but gorgeous clothes in dazzling pageants of breathtaking splendor. The stars who showcased such clothes, both on screen and off, exerted a powerful influence on women's shopping habits. Helen plays this role within the film, as she's a conspicuous fashion leader for other women who flock to emulate her. In this publicity still, she's trying on a Trojan gown while our handmaidens gaze at her in admiration. This aspect of star culture actually drives the plot of Private Life, in which the Trojan War is incited by the aggrieved Spartan garment industry because all the local women are imitating their queen's fashion choices. But how can an ancient mythic figure serve as a fashion model for modern women in the 1920s? Thanks to the influence of Art Deco, which incorporated Greek and other ancient elements into its designs, many supposedly Greek features of Helen's wardrobe would not have been out of place on a fashionable wealthy young woman in the 1920s. Here is Women's Wear Daily noting the Greek influence on current dress styles. Another newspaper informs us that, quote, headbands for the evening coiffure have taken a decidedly classical turn, copying designs such as Helen of Troy herself might have worn, unquote. Current fashions thus allowed Helen's wardrobe to bridge the gulf between ancient and modern, between real person and cinematic love goddesses. Reviewers applauded the incarnation of Helen's beauty in the person of Maria Corda. She's called optically dazzling, exquisitely beautiful, brilliantly beautiful, beautiful, statuesque, and decorative enough to carry Helen's reputation, an amazingly attractive young woman gifted with grace and poise, and the quote under this slide, a brilliant gem in a finely wrought setting. That setting includes every aspect of the mise-en-scene, but its most intimate layer consists of the fantastic wardrobe used to showcase the jewel of Helen's body. Reviewers speak approvingly of Maria Corda in, quote, various stages of slight clothing and of gorgeous, dainty, graceful frocks. Private life seems thus to have achieved the impossible. Through judicious casting, plus an enthusiastic embrace of contemporary fashions, it succeeded in providing a convincing rendition of the most beautiful woman in the world. In part two of the book, I turn to big screen epic. This section begins with a chapter on Troy's chief antecedent, the 1956 epic Helen of Troy, directed by Robert Wise. Despite Helen's reputation as a scandalous vamp, Wise took on the challenge of presenting her as a virtuous, admirable heroine. This was the period of such grand Cold War epics as Ben-Hur and the Ten Commandments. So the chapter places Wise, Wise's film in this cultural context looking at the pluses and minuses of locating the Trojan War story in this ideological framework. Helen is rendered virtuous by assimilating her to the Christian characters in such movies. But I show how Wise's efforts to make Helen a compelling figure were undermined by a number of factors, including casting and censorship. The next chapter focuses on Troy. Aside from my disappointment in Diane Kruger's Helen, which I mentioned earlier, I talk about how Helen is displaced by Brad Pitt in the role of Achilles, who becomes the film's central icon of erotic beauty. In this case, the film's socio-political context was informed by 9-11 and the subsequent US invasion of Iraq, the latest in a history of struggles between East and West that can be traced back to the Trojan War. In Troy, Helen is presented not as the real cause of the Trojan War, but as a flimsy excuse. This makes her analogous to the Iraqi weapons of mass destruction that, that were the pretext for Bush's invasion. Part three is about television. In marked contrast to the grand spectacles of ancient world, world epic, early TV was an intimate domestic medium. Technical constraints, low budgets, and cheap production values shifted the emphasis towards character and narrative. Budget limitations also freed television to be more adventurous than film in certain respects, unburdened as it was by the high financial stakes that make so many expensive blockbusters overcautious. It's no coincidence that the two TV Helens in chapter five are the only dark haired Helens in the book, both being played by mixed race actors who diverge noticeably from the conventional picture of Helen as a blue eyed blonde. The two television episodes discussed in this chapter both fall under the umbrella of speculative fiction, a collective term for science fiction, horror, and fantasy. 
such genres have always been hospitable to ancient myth. That's because, like myths, they use fantastical worlds as a way of talking about the real world that produced them. Like myth, too, these genres are all preoccupied at their core with what it is to be human. Within this broadly humanist concern, women occupy a special place. Are they natural or fabricated, animal or object, human or machine? Such anxieties have given birth not only to mythic figures like Pandora, but to a legion of fembots and female cyborgs, which have variously problematic relationships to, human to humanity in general and men in particular. Diverse though they are in many ways, however, to quote Jeffrey Brown, whatever the variety of formats, the modern gynoid is always presented as a sexually desirable, perfect woman. It is scarcely surprising then to learn from a pre pleasingly literal tabloid story provided to me by Kirk, who is here present, that Helen was an android as proven by newly discovered ancient documents, plus quote, parts of her transistorized body that have been allegedly found in her tomb. Her name has been invoked less literally in SF storytelling from Lester Del Rey's classic Helen O'Loy to John Wright's The Plural of Helen of Troy. She's also appeared repeatedly on television in genres like science fiction, fantasy, and horror, which fall under the umbrella of telefantasy. By definition, fantasy is not concerned with what really happened, but with more free-floating questions about what might happen in an alternate reality. Audiences are committed to the coherence of the show's own world, but not tied down by expectations of fidelity to antiquity as such. This results in a mutually beneficial relationship Ancient myth provides the imaginary worlds of telefantasy with a gloss of prestige, familiarity, tradition, and high culture, while the fantastical nature of such worlds helps to free classical receptions from the millstone of authenticity. As a result, telefantasy engages more daringly with Helen's mythical identity than many grander, more expensive productions. My first telefantasy Helen appears in an episode of the original series of Star Trek. Though nominally a series of outer space adventures aboard the Starship Enterprise, the show is intended to be a Trojan horse for important and meaningful things. The show's creator, Gene Roddenberry, conceived of the Enterprise as Starship Earth and thought of his stories as morality plays, which he used to promote a utopian humanistic vision of racial and sexual equality shaped by both Cold War politics and the progressive zeitgeist of the 60s. At a time when the space race was the province of white males and people of color were routinely portrayed in film and television by Caucasians, the cast as well as the Starship's crew was unusually diverse. Most notably, the communications officer Uhura, played by Nichelle Nichols, was quote, the first African-American woman to have a featured role on a long hour television drama. This commitment to equality was also supposed to apply to gender. In Roddenberry's original concept, one third of the crew of the Enterprise is female, and there is complete equality between members of the crew, between sexes and races. But he was never as committed to this aspect of his egalitarian vision and soon backed away from it. Uh, as you can tell by this uh, advertising poster where Uhura is no to, nowhere to be seen, no females. In consequence, the series as produced was basically patriarchal and sexist in a very traditional way. This is notoriously true of the white male hero, the womanizing Captain Kirk. Kirk has much in common with the archetypal voyager Odysseus, another brave, crafty, and impetuous leader who finds a desirable but dangerous female in nearly every port. Homer's Odysseus is temporarily ensnared by Circe, Calypso, Nausicaa, and Helen herself. Similarly, Kirk has his disposable females, Cameron Blair's phrase for the alluring characters that show up in countless episodes only to die, disappear, or remain on the planet of the week. Just as Odysseus always leads these charmers in the end to travel home to Ithaca, Kirk always ends up leaving his female lovers for his one true love, not Penelope, but the starship Enterprise. It's as one of these disposable females that Helen of Troy enters the Star Trek universe. The title of the third season episode, Elan of Troyus, marks it as one of several drawing on themes from Mediterranean antiquity. 
the most strikingly Greek of these episodes, Who Mourns for Adonais, presents us with prevailing pop cultural stereotypes about ancient Greek beauty. It portrays the god Apollo as a powerful alien who is frustrated by the crew's refusal to worship him. When he takes a fancy to Carolyn, the ship's archaeologist, he expresses his desire by dressing her in long classical drapery with elaborately styled blonde hair and promising to make her a goddess. Given the obvious mythic re resonance of the episode's title, viewers may have expected Elan to resemble Carolyn. Yet she departs radically from the familiar draped blonde figure of supposedly Greek beauty to convey the threat of the feminine other in ways more visible to viewers in the turbulent 1960s. The episode first aired in December 1968 at the conclusion of what had been a climactic year of civil strife. In April, much of the country had erupted after the murder of Martin Luther King. In September, feminists had protested the sexism of the Miss America pageant and civil rights activists its racism. In November, Shirley Chisholm became the first black woman elected to Congress. Elan of Troyes configures Helen as one of Kirk's disposable females in a way that engages directly with these powerful social and political currents. The title character is the ruler or doll man of a planet named Elas, which is at odds with the neighboring planet Troyus. Elas and Troyus, obvious equivalents of Hellas and Troy, recapitulate some of the stereotypes already associated in popular culture with the Spartans and Trojans. The Elasians are armor-clad, brutal, and authoritarian. Troyus is softer, more peaceful, and more supposedly civilized. The Trojans are physically marked as alien by green skin and peculiar hair, and there's no such visible sign setting the Elasians apart from humanity, but we're informed early on that their women's tears contain what McCoy, the ship's doctor, calls a subtle mystical power that drives men wild. These magical tears, with their power to disrupt men's autonomy and rational control, exemplify science fiction's well-worn conceptualization of women as the truly threatening alien. They also update the Egyptian drug used by Helen in the Odyssey, which impairs men's emotions and moral judgment in a way that aligns with her erotic power over men. Like Helen, too, Elan is a member of the ruling class whose marriage has large political implications for war and peace. Despite her status as Dolman, like most renditions of Helen and many a female monarch, she had no say in the matter of her marriage, to which she happens to be violently opposed. The enterprise has therefore been ordered to convey her to Troyes for the wedding, but to proceed slowly so that the captain can reconcile her to the marriage along the way. His task is a challenging one, since the unreconstructed Elan is an autocratic, violent, ill-mannered, and uncooperative bigot who refers to her differently colored opponent as a green pig. In the captain's own words, she's an uncivilized savage, a vicious monster, an arrogant child in a woman's body. Precisely halfway through the episode, however, Elan changes tactics. Turning on the tears and adopting submissive body language, she mournfully tells Kirk that she just wants to be liked but doesn't know how. It's no coincidence that tears are the instrument of Elasian women's power, since they are a way of grounding irresistible eroticism in female submission and self-loathing. Like the Homeric Helen, Elan is adept at winning men's sympathy through tearful, self-denigrating speech. Sure enough, this strategic performance of femininity elicits the softer side of Kirk's paternalism. He falls predictably into the trap, touches her wet cheek, and is instantly overcome with desire. We've been informed repeatedly that there's no antidote for Elasian tears. Nevertheless, when a Klingon sh ship provokes the Enterprise, Kirk rises to the occasion, subordinating romance to his duty as a starship commander. This inspires Elan to perform her own duty, since she, like him, has supposedly no choice. She must accept the responsibilities and obligations that go with the privileges and prerogatives of her title. Sadly but meekly, she beams down to Troyus to enter on her new role as diplomatic wife. Like Euripides Iphigenia, who first protests her victimization but then embraces it, 
Elan becomes complicit in her own sacrifice. Kirk too is nominally heartbroken, but he remains free, like Odysseus, to move on to his next mission and his next love affair. Elan was played by Franz Nguyen, who brought to the role a remarkable racial and cultural complexity. A child of a French mother and a Vietnamese but ethnically Chinese father, Nguyen reports that her mother was persecuted by the Nazis because she looked Jewish. Culturally, she was entirely French. She arrived in the US speaking no English and retained a distinctive accent. Unusually for Star Trek's disposable females, she also brought to her guest role the image and temperament of a star. She had a personal reputation for anger, outspokenness, scandal, and even violence, in part because of an affair with Marlon Brando that ended badly, all making her an excellent fit for the unreconstructed Elan. She was also personally involved in the civil rights movement and was devastated by the murder of Bobby Kennedy, which occurred during the filming of this episode. In keeping with Nguyen's ethnicity, Elan embodies certain Asian stereotypes, most notably that of the dragon lady, famously portrayed by Anna May Wong, as suggested by the jeweled dagger in her sleeve. But she's not simply stereotyped as Asian. Rather, she's a walking compendium of racialized and gendered exotica. Her makeup doesn't emphasize her Asian features, but looks racially indeterminate. Her complexion is darkened, and she wears heavy black braids. This racial complexity is reinforced by a smorgasbord of exoticizing cultural signifiers. Her title, Dolman, sounds like the Turkish Dolman, a kind of robe with oriental overtones and the origin of the Dolman sleeves that were fashionable in this period. She also wears a metallic bindi, of a kind that became fashionable in the counterculture of the late 60s, especially after the Beatles visited India earlier the same year. And of course, she retains her French accent. This racial complexity makes Elan unusual among Captain Kirk's numerous love objects. The hair on the heads of the disposable females may be blonde, brunette, or green, but those heads typically belong to Anglophone Caucasians, even when the character is not Caucasian. Elan is even more exceptional, however, as an incarnation of Helen of Troy. Her jet black hair, in sharp contrast with Helen's usual blonde, suggests strength, assertiveness, seriousness, evil, or some combination thereof. In an ancient context, it evokes not Helen, but Cleopatra. Elan's braids in particular, which get a lot of attention from the camera, align her with popular cinematic images of the Egyptian queen and other similar vamps. To aid with mainstream audience identification, such Egyptians are typically played by white actors, most famously Elizabeth Taylor in the 1963 epic. But Elan's dark skin and black braids suggest a different kind of identification, racializing her in contemporary American terms as African-American. As such, the fiery, violent Elan poses a challenge to Star Trek's optimistic racial politics. This is underlined by the sharp contrast with Uhura, the short show's normative model of black womanhood. Uhura is voluptuous but demure, wholesome, neatly coiffed, smooth-haired, self-disciplined, compliant, and relegated to the margins of most episodes, including this one. She belongs securely in the racial world of contemporary television, which is described by Herman Gray as a world of black invisibility structured by the logic of colorblindness and driven by the discourse of assimilation. The figure of Uhura thus contains the explosive potential for violence and sexual self-assertion in the exoticized female other. The unreconstructed Elan, by contrast, unleashes that potential, manifesting in both appearance and behavior, the unvarnished female and racialized anger and self-assertion that were of such acute contemporary concern. The contrast with Ohura is dramatized by locating Elan in the latter's cabin, pointedly opposing the uncivilized alien to the assimilated black woman with her feminine comforts and gently exoticized objet d'art. Elan rages within the cabin's confines like a trapped animal, tossing her braids and thumping the velvet pillows in frustration, the straps on her outfit suggesting the constraints under which she suffers. She smashes Ahura's tchotchkes and hurls her dagger at the captain. When the Trojan ambassador offers her special wedding regalia, 
consisting of a dress, slippers, and necklace, she literally throws them back in his face, calling these ridiculous female trappings an offense to her eyes. By the end of the episode, however, Elan has embraced these very trappings. Her ultimate submission is signaled by her voluntary assumption of the hated wedding gown, that's the blue dress. Before leaving the Enterprise, she conclusively embraces femininity by giving the captain her dagger as a keepsake. We last see her trapped and immobilized in the transporter as she literally fades away before our eyes. In contemporary cultural terms, the rage of black power has been replaced by the decorum and self-effacement of the model minority. The dragon lady has metamorphosed into Madame Butterfly. As a barbaric male acting female outsider who rejects marriage and is supposedly civilized by subjection to patriarchal authority, Elan bears a distinct resemblance to the ancient Greek Amazons. Kirk, for his part, gets to play the heroic Greek male role of civilizer like Theseus or Heracles, both of whom subdued Amazon queens. Yet his eventual erotic self-control aligns him most pointedly with Odysseus, who is immune to Circe's magic, refuses immortality with Calypso, and saves the day for his comrades by resisting the spell-binding power of Helen's voice when they are hidden inside the Trojan horse. Kirk won up his ancient predecessors, however, in key respects. Homer's Odysseus can only resist Circe's magic because the gods give him a preemptive antidote. To be sure, McCoy eventually comes up with an antidote for Elysian tears, but only after Kirk has already shown that he's man enough not to need it. The captain outdoes Menelaus, too, by refusing to cause a war over the woman he supposedly loves, or succumb in the end to the power of her beauty. Yielding to that power temporarily makes him a Paris figure, risking interplanetary war through his inability to resist Eros. In the end, however, he becomes a kind of anti-Paris who sacrifices love to shore up the institution of arranged marriage. This enables him to outdo his Greek forebears in the most important way of all. It took the Trojan War to transform the errant Helen into the subdued and dutiful wife of the Odyssey. But Kirk domesticates Elan ahead of time, thus preventing an even more terrible war from taking place. Elan of Troyes, whose title alludes transparently to the Trojan War story, thus turns into a reversal of that story. Instead of female desire leading to adultery and warfare, peace is produced by maintaining the integrity of a royal marriage at the price of a beautiful woman's erotic autonomy. Instead of inducing a woman to leave a man she can't stand, love turns that woman into a dutiful but unhappy wife to precisely such a man. Overall then, Kirk is far more successful than ancient Greek mythology at controlling the dangerous power of female beauty that is symbolically enshrined in Helen. By racializing that power in contemporary terms, this updated mythical narrative of taming the feminine other purports to control in one stroke the double threat of female self-assertion and racial fury that was roiling the nation. In chapter five of my new book, this discussion of Elan is paired with an episode of Xena Warrior Princess, which places Helen in the context of 1990s feminism. The actor who played this Helen, Galen George, was again of mixed race, but this time Helen is presented as an ordinary approachable woman. I argue that this makes her a new kind of essential woman, not a figure for male fear, but a blank slate for female identification. As such, she is stripped of her traditional attributes, awe-inspiring beauty, manipulation of men, and erotic self-assertion. These attributes are transferred, however, to the figure of Xena, who combines them with traditionally masculine traits to produce a new kind of heroine. The final chapter looks at a 2023 miniseries entitled Helen of Troy. This miniseries was based on an avowedly feminist script, which was intended by the writer Ronnie Kern to rescue Helen from her historical infamy. It presents her not as a vamp, but as a spirited teenager who is oppressed and ultimately subdued by the patriarchy, as personified by her rap rapist Agamemnon. Though most critics panned the miniseries, in part for its female focus, it was welcomed enthusiastically by teenage girls who identified with Helen as an agent, not just a beautiful object. 
This chapter and the book ends with the difficulty and importance of producing new versions of Helen and of the Trojan War story for new generations. So those are my six Helens of Troy. Uh, for this talk, I've been focusing primarily on my personal favorites, but I'm happy to answer any questions you may have about any or all of them. Um, just before we do that, however, I want to let you know that um, if you're interested in getting the book, Princeton is offering a 30% off discount with the code P325. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, we have some time for questions. Does anybody, would anybody like to ask a question? Um, to ask a question, you can either raise your hand or simply unmute yourself. Yeah, hi. Um I'm very interested in uh, writing my own adaptation of Helen. Uh, yeah, I'm doing it slightly differently than pretty much all of the ones you described, except the last one. But yeah, I'm I'm a little worried about because, yeah, there's there's some there's somebody else who tried to do a feminist take before I did. But yeah, it's like I'm not that worried because. My feminist takes probably way different than his. But, Hers. Yeah. Um, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, well, there are obviously an infinite number of ways in which you can do this. So I don't think you need to worry about the fact that that uh, this version already exists. Um, in fact, uh, I actually interviewed the, the feminist writer, Ronnie Kern, and that's how I know so much about her. And um, she herself, told me about the, the struggle that she had in getting the um, the um, uh, channel, what do you call them, the, the ABC, they are, ABC, to actually make the film the way, she, the miniseries, the way she wanted it to be. And she felt like that they re really ruined her script. I think that it actually does come out um, better than she expected, better than she thought at the time. Yeah, um, it's, it seems like it, it, it did come out pretty well. Oh, you've seen it? I haven't seen it, but I've. But from what you're saying about it, yeah. Well, it sounds still, pretty like something I'd like to see. Yeah. Well, it's easily available. It's available on YouTube, and you can buy the DVD. And it's, it's a lot that I didn't say. I just gave you this little capsule summary. Yeah. But... I, I, yeah. My my Helen's actually inter interesting because yeah, you know, I, I I'm autistic, and I made my Helen completely socially inept. Uh huh. So, so that that's how I got started on it, and and she's become like my main story for now. So, yeah, I wanted to say that. Okay. Thank you. Sounds different and interesting. And there may be questions in the chat as well. Can you check the chat? Yeah, thank you, Micah. Um, let's see. I don't see any questions in the chat um does anybody else have oh uh sabine do you have a question i see your hand raised yes i do uh, sorry i had a uh, trouble here <clears throat> turning on my voice um i just wanted to ask you because you just said you had a chance to talk to the director of the last version you just showed us can you maybe tell us uh, what what was changed by the TV station exactly? Um, what did she like? What was she so um or most disappointed about uh, changing or something? Because I think that's an information I will never get myself. And thanks for the presentation; it was very good. Thank you very much. Um, just for your information, I'm actually publishing my interview with her in a, a new book. Um. I think it's going to be called Feminist Writers, Female Writers in the Classics. And it's going to have articles about women writers, but also um, it's going to have a few interviews with, with writers. And so you, if you wish, you can in fact see everything in there, at least all the good parts. It's, it's heavily edited because she talked a lot. <laughs> um, she, well, to start with, um, 
she started with Helen being like really, really old and telling the story of the Trojan War to Homer. This is actually an ancient idea. But as she said, uh, nobody at the studio liked the idea of an old Helen. So forget that. They weren't going to have an old Helen. Um, what else did she say? Um, she, she was mainly mad at the director. She said she had a really a good director and then at the last minute he got fired and then this new director came along and he was um, he completely messed up her script and she complained a lot about how he put in a lot more fighting. But um, guys just want a lot of fighting in their, in their epic stories, traditional stories. Um, what else did she say? That would be just, that would be the, the gist of it more or less um there's nudity in this as well this is the only one which has nudity and she did write that into the script but i think she didn't expect it to be filmed necessarily the way it was filmed and i i can send the the reference to the interview to to the organizers if if they want to share that um with people certainly um thank you uh, Neil? <clears throat> uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the lecture, Professor. It was very interesting to me. And um, I have two questions, and I'll try, to, I'll try to ask them in an intelligent way. One of them is, uh, I was interested in the early part of your lecture where you talked about different, um, uh, different ideas about fashion. Yeah. And how um, you know Helen's costume changed, and it in some ways reflected changes in uh, society's preference for costume. I'd love to know what sources you consulted uh, for for that. Um, it's just uh, an interest of mine. I'm working on a project of my own and trying to understand the connection between social values and what women end up wearing. Right, were you interested in Greek fashions or in the in the films? I'm interested in the film's interpretation of, right. or you know, in, in how society consumed those fashion ideas and maybe even um, amplified them. Right, well, um, I'm, uh, I don't know what to say other than that it's all in the book. <laughs> so okay. I, 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 I mean, I could tell you more about it now, but all the, the references to the literature and so on are, are all in the book. I did a lot of research online. <laughs> I, did, I could not have written this book without the internet because mm -hmm. um, I found lots and lots of interesting stuff online. Um, but there are also things that have been written about this. Um, and and you will find those in the notes in the, in, in the book. Okay, and the discount code you gave us was P325? P325, I believe. Okay. Three, two, five. The other question has to do with um, other aspects of Helen besides her beauty, mm -hmm. um, because in you know in other sources in Euripides and in certainly the novels of Pat Barker, um, she comes across as being a rounder figure than uh, Hollywood. Uh, Hollywood's interested in her as a babe. As um, and yet she was much more than that. Yeah. And I wonder whether you uh, are aware of or could tell us about examples of how other, uh, aside from Pat Barker, for example, other types of uh, media and film or, or elsewhere have tried to present a very different view of Helen than one, what we're accustomed to. Yes, there's been a huge outpouring of feminist retellings of ancient myths, including the Trojan War. As you say, Pat Barker and others, Emily Hauser and others have, have, have written on that subject. Um, I think even in the movies I talk about, which are pop, pop culture at its lowest, mostly, um, I think that's more, in most of them, there's quite a bit more to her than her looks. I focus mm -hmm. on beauty because there's the issue of representation and how do you do that on screen, which I was interested in. Um, but I do also talk about other aspects of her character. So, um, at, uh, well, I talked at length about my two favorites. Um, one of them is Maria Corda and her character, it's a comedy. And it's, uh, 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 she's, she's witty and manipulative and a bunch of other qualities that you could attribute also to the Greek Helen. Mm -hmm. 
Um, let me see, what else did I talk about? The, um, the 1956 uh, epic is unfortunate. <laughs> it's really, um, the, it had a lot of problems, partly because they couldn't get a big star to play the role and partly because the censorship in that period was terrible. Um, but the director, Robert Wise, really tried to make her a substantive person mm -hmm. who's it, not just about the beauty. And he tries to also make her really morally upright and virtuous. She does not intend to run off with Paris. Um, it's all a big mistake. Um, and she's self-sacrificing and all of those things. So he kind of makes her into a, a virtuous heroine on the model of Christianity, which, as I mentioned, shows up in, in the ancient world epics of that period. Um, then the the miniseries, well, Alan of Troy is my other total favorite, uh, has a lot of personality, but it is all negative at the beginning. Right. Um, but she's a great character. And I should mention that um, fan fiction has rescued her. Um, in, in the episode, she ends up being basically subdued and sent off to marry a man she hates. But in fan fiction, and there are several versions, but in one, she basically finds a kitchen knife and kills the husband. <laughs> and in another version, she gets made into um, the general of the army and spends the rest of her career as a warrior. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, she has a lot going on in different ways. Um, and the last one I mentioned, um, the feminist one, she's, she has a lot of, she's very girly. She's got a very girlish personality, but she uh, evolves to become um, a more mature woman as she goes along. So all of them in their own way, they, they attribute something to her that's more than just her, being a babe. Um, but yet every rendition has to deal with the fact that she is a babe and that's her most famous defining feature. Right. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to have to deal with that, too, eventually, probably. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, so we have one more question in the chat, and then, um, Marcus, you have your hand raised. So I'll read the question in the chat. Um, it says, hi, thanks so much for the insightful lecture. What do you think we can take away from this as we continue to appraise modern media portrayals of Greek and Roman antiquity from Christian? Well, I think what you can take away is that you can do whatever you want. <laughs> um, and I would really like people to take away the point about clothes. I mean, people often ask me, who do I think should play Helen of Troy? Like, who is beautiful enough? And I'm like, it doesn't matter what you look like if you've got the outfits. Um, it's about presentation. And so much of her character, it's about presentation. And this gets, it's not just the clothes and the jewelry. Um, it's also the voice, how you speak, how you, how seductive you are. Beauty does not inhere simply in features. It inheres in voice, body language, movement, um, uh, and how you wear your clothes, all of that stuff. Um, and I think that can be used in many, many different ways. Um, I kind of want to, my fantasy Helen is a one who um, basically burns down Menelaus's house and just runs off, you know, completely under her own agency. Um, but uh, I don't know if that's going to happen. <laughs> uh, like I say, you can, it's, it's uh, a, a wide open playing field. Um, and I think we're going to see more and more, oh, some, <laughs> well, I think we're going to see more and more um, versions that try to recuperate her for feminism in different ways as we go ahead, because that's the current fashion. Thank you. Um, Marcus? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this lecture. It was uh, fascinating and um, I admire how much ground you covered in very little time and it never felt like broad stroke, but it was also very precise and nuanced. So. Thank you. Um, it was great. And uh, I'm afraid my, my question is also a little broad stroke. And if it's impossible to answer, just uh, just let me know. But um, so clearly there were very many different Helens uh, in the course of your talk. And 
so if we turn from Helen to the men, or at least to the male, uh, to the main male characters in her films, would you say are they are they similarly varied and different and sometimes adventurous, or or is the male are the male counterparts a little more predictable because they are just as you said rational and in control if things are as they should be and that's pretty much it and and it's really the helens who have to you know bad you know, uh, find their place somewhere in, in confrontation with or submission to or negotiation with the men so is, is are the men similarly varied or are they more the same constant over the over the decades that's a great question um and the answer is kind of yes and no they are less i, I would say overall less varied um, I mean, they, they have to have certain qualities, like Menelaus is always going to be a bit of a loser. Um, the one in the miniseries stands out that way, and, and the, the the writer told me she had gone to some trouble to make Menelaus be a more appealing character. He's kind of, And he kind of starts to maybe learn to appreciate her at the end kind of thing. <laughs> uh, but usually he's just kind of, a, um, he's got a little bit of a loser, and Agamemnon is always a like a big mean thug. Mm -hmm. um, with slight variations on a big mean thug. The best, the miniseries has the best Agamemnon. It's Rufus Sewell and he's really excellent. And he does end up raping Helen really brutally. And, mm -hmm. you know, there are lots of ways you can change ancient, ancient mythology, but I think most people would feel in their gut that actually Agamemnon raping Helen is pretty plausible <laughs> um, to, to um, his character. Um, what about the other men? Um, it also depends on the genre. So, you know, the private life is a, is a comedy and the, the the Paris figure in that looks like Rudolph Valentino. He's like the supposedly Latin lover type. So, but the short answer to your question is, I think you're right. They are less varied. There There is variation, but um, they're a little bit more cut and dried. I wouldn't call them rational though, or in control necessarily. I mean, they're in control politically, but I wouldn't, um, right, yeah. I don't know if in control of themselves. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, just a few announcements um, before we go. Um, so um, we have our uh, Living Latin Conference tomorrow um, over this weekend in NYC, um, which should be a lot of fun. Um, and we're hosting a hybrid lecture at that event on Sunday. Um, the topic of that lecture is um, technology and the sailing of Ulysses. Um, I'll put the link for that in the chat. Um, and then uh, the other announcement is that our um, online courses are um, in enrollment right now. Um, we have about a week left. Um, there's actually one course in particular um, for those of you who are interested in learning more about um, cultural studies and classical reception, um, we have a class on um, the way that the artists or the way that um, classics are received in um, popular culture from um, from soap operas to um, comics. Uh, so I'll put the chat for that class in here as well. Um, and there's many other classes. Um, and that's it. Um, thank you again, Ruby um, Blondell for speaking with us. And um, thank you everyone for coming. I hope you have a great weekend. Uh, thank you all very much. Thank you, and yeah, I, thank you. I just wanted to um, ask one last question, if that's okay. Before I forget. Um, Micah, I think that um, we are no longer all here, so. Uh, maybe if you want to uh, write in your question, we can share it with uh, Professor yeah, I'll, I'll write in the question and she can email me back or, 
Yeah, it's already written in the comments, kind of not as a question, but it's about it's about Achilles and whether I don't know. I was just pondering his heritage as kind of his mom was a Nereid, apparently, and yeah, I was thinking, oh God, what if he had he was a they and they had shape shifting powers. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, feel free to respond to yeah, that. Yeah, and I, I'm just, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll ask later. Yep. Have a great evening, everyone. Have a great weekend. Thank you.